Hello class, this is Demetrius Wilson again. Uh, we are back with chapter five. Uh, as usual, we will start our lecture with our reading rainbow section. This is a great uh, one, a case study to, to examine and to check out because uh, it shows uh, you know, the cyclical nature of business and how those businesses can go from family businesses to being sold to uh, being uh, you know, more of a corporation type business and uh, how things happen from there and you know what happens with the family uh, you know after the fact uh, so uh, this is in your book uh, but want to you know touch on a few key points and discuss it uh, consolidated industries uh, hammer forge uh, so consolidated industries represents one of the, the thousands of small manufacturers that exist throughout the United States and those are great businesses uh, if you don't know uh, you know it's just that you know a lot of times you know people in our community have uh, not been able to uh, be a part of such businesses. Uh, it's been in business uh, for more than 60 years, uh, specializing in the forging of uh, ferrous and non-ferrous and exotic materials. Uh, its prime customer base has been the aerospace industry. Uh, it has also expanded into other industrial customers, right? So aerospace industry, obviously, you know, big money if you're downtown like El Segundo, uh, you know, towards that area, you see all the big companies like, uh, you know, like Raytheon, uh, like what used to be Hughes Aircraft and things of that nature, Boeing uh, over in Long Beach. Uh, originally a family business, uh, Consolidated Industries uh, was sold to new owners in 1999. Uh, once the owner reached retirement age, his children, a brother and sister, found it difficult to agree on the future uh, direction of the company. And that's that's normal, right? You know, some people have different views and values. Uh, this period of confusion uh, was made more difficult when the head of sales died, right? So, you know, if you cut off the, the fountain of money, uh, that, that's going to be tough as well. Uh, competitors exploited this situation. Uh, the new CEO, John Wilbur, immediately recognized that there had been some complacency about generating new customers and the firm uh, would not be able to survive in the long run uh, merely on its backlog of orders, right? You had to generate new business. Uh, so Wilbur uh, began to aggressively deal with the firm's problems and build its customer base. In 10 years, he was able to take consolidated industry sales from $8 million to a year of $30 uh, million a year, right? And so the key point to that is in 10 years, right? It wasn't like he said in one year, it was in 10 years, right? So a lot of people want quick fixes, snap my fingers, wave my magic wand, but it doesn't quite work like that. He attributes much of this success to the firm's uh, commitment uh, to business planning, right? Uh, I'll tell you something, if any guys are in uh, project management, which may have already shifted to product, one thing they always say is proper planning prevents poor performance, right? You can use that, you know, in, whether in business or in life. Uh, soon after taking over the business, he started a comprehensive planning process, uh, given the pressing issues the firm was facing. Uh, the first plan had a one-year horizon, right? So everything can't be done in a day. Uh, it was instrumental in gaining the support of consolidated industries bankers, right? So you, you have to have a game plan if you, you know, want to tell people to give you money, right? You have to learn to say, hey, this is how we're going to make money, and this is how we're going to pay you back for the loans that you give us, uh, which carried it through those difficult years. In the, inter in the intervening years, the plan's horizon was expanded to five years. Although Wilbur admitted uh, about that the projections uh, may be pipe dreams, right? So, you know, like you're saying, like, hey, this may or may not happen. After the first two years, he said it was important to maintain the five-year horizon to force the business to think about the future. And you always have to think about the future. Some of those companies that we talked about didn't think about the future and they're gone. Blockbuster's gone. Circuit City's gone. That's, that's how it works. Uh, the main goals of the plan had been to examine ways to lower costs and expand the customer base, particularly uh, outside of the aerospace industry, right? So if you lower costs, that's just like making money, right? So let's say you make $50,000 a year and you spend $20,000. let us say you start saving $10,000. You just gave yourself a $10,000 raise, right? Uh, the plan will be constantly evolving. Detailed metrics will provide guidance uh, to the various units throughout the firm. Uh, these metrics uh, were broken down into a quarterly basis and were color-coded to allow the various units to see how well they were progressing toward the achievement of the goals, right? So if you've been in sales, you see that board, it's always like, hey, here's the scoreboard, here's what that person has been doing this month, and here's what you've been doing, and they're tracking those goals, right? You know, you know that leaderboard is up there. Uh, it had a detailed sales plan that emphasized de uh, developing new customers and new industries. Uh, to this end, uh, it significantly focused on developing new products. Uh, and in the past few years, uh, the number of new products increased from six per year to 70 per year, right? So we're getting new things out, getting feedback from customers in terms of what they want, and what they need. 
Uh, this meant an enlargement of the engineering staff, but it also meant a closer relationship with this customer. So like I said, you know, a close relationship, understand what they want, uh, give the people what they want. Right? Uh, Wilbur estimated that 50% of the new products were a co-design with customers. Uh, the planning process will also enable the business to incorporate technology in new ways. The firm used video conferencing to communicate with both customers and sister units. And, you know, that's every day tonight, you know, these days, right? everybody's using video conferencing. Uh, another important element of the plan was a concept of a concept of succession planning. As vital as the planning process was, Wilbur said, it's all about people. Uh, any plan to improve the firm uh, has to bring the people into the process and bring them together. And like I, you know, may have mentioned in other classes, uh, you know, I took over a business unit one time and I did not. Uh, bring the people together. I just came in and said, this is the way it is, swashbuckling all the way. If you don't like it, get out. And they, they did it, but it did not bring the people together. And I can guarantee I would have garnered greater results if I had have done it the right way. But best part about that is that I learned from it. Uh, you know, a lot of times people think that, you know, just being perfect and pristine all the way is the way to go. And, it's, and it, you know, it's really not, you know, make some mistakes, uh, do some things wrong, you learn from them, and you'll get better along the way. So let's talk about uh, developing your, your strategy as a business. Uh, so some learning objectives that we have, uh, understand the term strategy and why it's important for small business. A lot of times people ignore strategy when it comes to small business. Hey, I'm just trying to get this, I'm too busy. I'm trying to get this business off the ground. That's all I can do. Uh, define four generic strategies identified by Porter, uh, who is uh, you know a renowned expert on business. Uh, evaluate the ramifications of uh, each generic strategy uh, for the operations of a small business. Uh, so I have a couple quotes in here that are great, uh, you know, and quotes aren't going to be on your quiz or test, but they're good to just you know understand like you know how you want to think about things. Uh, without a strategy, the organization is like a ship without a rudder going around in circles right so there's an old school song that says go around in circles right you're just going to keep going around in circles and you're, you're never going to get it done right so that's uh, by joel ross and uh, michael cammy uh it is critically important for any business organization to be able to accurately understand and identify what constitutes customer value right so not only do you have to know and understand who your customers are but you need to know what is value in their mind who cares what value is in your mind right maybe you have it right maybe you don't but you have to know and understand what the value is in the customer's mind. Uh, to do this, one must have a clear idea of who your customers are or will be, right? So you have to know and understand, are my customers somebody who's rich? Is my customer somebody who's middle class? Is my customer somebody who does not have a lot of money? Uh, you know, I was coming back from track practice uh, earlier today and uh, my kids were like, why is that line so long? And I looked up and it was Costco gas, right? And so we're gonna talk about how you become like a price leader and things like that. And I said, well, you know, Costco's gas is very cost effective. And then people get up all times in the morning and they, they're willing to sit there in those lines to get that gas. Uh, you know, me, I can't do it. You know, I feel like, you know, maybe I should be able to take the time out of the day, but a lot going on. And I'm like, I'm going to the quickest gas station and it, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, if it costs a few cents more, I'm just going to try and get in and get out. And so it's all about, you know, what your preference is. Uh, here's an example. A restaurant identified its prime customer base as being upscale clientele, right? So those people want to go spend the big bucks in the business section of a major city. A restaurant recognized that it has numerous competitors uh, that are interested in providing the same clientele with an upscale dining experience. Our example restaurant might provide a five course five-star gourmet meal to its customers. It also provides a superlative service. Uh, if, com com if a comparable restaurant failed to provide a comparable meal, then the example restaurant, right, would have a competitive advantage, right? So if my food is, let's rate it as A, and your food is rated as a B, and our prices are the same, I now have a competitive advantage. Now, if my prices are lower and your food is better, now it's about preference, right? Now, you know, you have more money than me, so you're going to go to that restaurant that has better food. I don't have as much money, so I'm going to go to the restaurant, you know, that, that you know, the, the price is a little bit lower. So providing excellent customer service may be a necessary condition for business survival, uh, but it in itself is not sufficient condition. So meaning it may be necessary for you to have great customer service, right? I feel like in my industry that I'm in, it's necessary that we have great customer service, right? Uh, and like I said to you guys, we don't call it customer service. We call it our, our member loyalty department because that's the point. We want to do right by them and keep them as members. But, uh, you know, some companies just don't focus on that because they don't have to. Uh, other companies, 
you know, have to do it. They absolutely have to do it to survive. But that is not the only, that can't be the only thing steering the ship. Uh, you know, if you have terrible pro a terrible product, doesn't matter how good your customer service is, uh, you are not going to survive. Uh, the word strategy is derived from a Greek word, uh, strategos, uh, which roughly translates into the art of the general, namely a military leader, leader right? So the general, he's the guy who's leading the troops, right? And sometimes the, the, the funny thing is like everybody thinks people, you know, want to be the one all the way at the top in charge. Some people want to be a general. Some people like the action. Some people like the, the thrill of it. Uh, so, you know, you, a lot of generals, they, they like that and they stay in those positions because they really, they feel like they can lead something and leading people into battle and they're, they're great leaders. So generals are responsible for marshalling required resources and organizing the troops and the basic plan of attack. Much in the same way, executives as owners of businesses are expected to have a general idea of the desired outcomes, uh, acquire resources that they need for those outcomes, and uh, hire and train personnel and generate plans to achieve those outcomes. Uh, in this sense, all, the, all businesses, large and small, have strategies, uh, whether they are clearly written out in a formal business plan or reside in the mind of the owner of a business. And I'll tell you the latter, you do not want them to reside in the in the mind of the owner of the business because I always say, uh, you know, not, I know it sounds crazy, but what's your plan if somebody steps off a curb and gets hit by hit by a bus? Then the business ceases to exist if everything's in that person's mind. Uh, we have argued that all businesses have strategies, whether they are explicitly articulated or not, and that's true. You know, it might be a bad strategy because you don't have one that's terrible. My strategy is just play it as it goes. Uh, that's still a strategy, right? Not a good one, but still a strategy. Uh, Perry stated that small business leaders seem to recognize that the ability to formulate and implement an effective strategy has a major influence on the survival and success of a small business. And obviously it does. And I, I know it's very, very easy for small businesses to not, you know, uh, you know, create a strategy or do the things that they need to do and cross the T's and dot the, dot the I's, but it, it's, it's necessary if you want to survive, right? Uh, the extent to which a strategy should be articulated in a formal manner, such as part of a business plan, is highly dependent on the type of business. Uh, one might not expect a formally drafted strategy statement from a non-employee business, meaning it's just one person, uh, funded singularly uh, by the owner. Uh, one researcher found that the formal that formal plans are rare in businesses with fewer than five employees. But it's still important because that business plan is not just about your strategy. You know, you have to have that business plan because a lot of times people will not give you a loan. They won't give you money, won't give you grants unless you present a business plan. And the, the brass tax of it, which people hate me to hate for me to say a lot of times, is that a lot of times like if you're going to a bank or something like that, they want to know how are you going to pay me back when you fail? Right. That's what we want to know. Like, what am I going to come take when your business fails? I mean, it sucks to say that, but that's, that's you know, the mindset that they have. Uh, so clearly specifying your strategy uh, should be seen uh, as an end in itself, uh, requiring the company to specify a strategy focus uh, that the company uh, to think about its core issues. Uh, and so here are some of those, uh, you know, things that you should be thinking about. So who are your customers? How are you going to provide value to those customers, which we already mentioned those two? Who are your current and future competitors, right? Who's in the game with you right now and who's coming in later? Uh, what are your resources and how are you going to use these resources, right? You have to know and think about all of these things. Uh, and th th this is a quote and this is a good one. Uh, Never ceases to amaze me how many people will use GPS or Google Maps for a trip somewhere. But when it comes to starting a business, they think that you can do it without any strategy or without any guiding roadmap, right? So you can't even get around to the 7-Eleven without punching in, uh, you know, something into your phone. It's, it's, it's so funny. They, they've definitely handicapped us. So, you know, sometimes I, you know, I go to punch something in. I, I just stop and say, you know what, I'm going to figure it out. I've been here before. I'm just going to make my way there because uh, I don't want my brain to be so dependent, so, uh, you know, uh, attuned to only using it through technology. For some of you that are a little older, you guys remember Thomas Guides. And there's this big book of maps and you pick, break out the map and say, okay, this is how I get here and this is how I get there. Uh, you know, there was no GPS, there was no Google Maps or anything like that. Uh, so I already talked about like the, the strategies, uh, but, you know, we'll get a little bit more in depth about it. The cost leadership strategy requires that a firm be in the position of being the lowest cost uh, producer in a competitive environment. Uh, by being the lowest cost producer, a firm has several uh, strategic options open to it. It can sell a product or service at a lower price, right? So if I sell it for a lower price, we have equal value in product. They're going to buy mine. 
Uh, if a price is a major driver of customer value, then the firm with the lowest price should sell more, right? So if that's important and I have a lower price, then I'm going to sell more than you. Uh, perhaps the clearest example of a firm that employs a cost leadership strategy is Walmart, right? Look, Walmart does extremely well. Uh, Walmart's investment in customer relations and inventory control, plus its huge size, enables it to uh, secure the best deals uh, from suppliers and drastically reduce costs, right? So if I'm buying thousands and thousands of this piece of wood from you, right, you're going to give me some breaks. But if Joe Schmo is buying one piece of wood from you, then you're probably not going to give him any type of break. Uh, it might appear that the cost leadership strategies are most suitable for large firms uh, that can exploit the economies of scale. Uh, this is not necessarily true, right? So, um, you know, you may think that it may sound natural, but it's not true. Uh, smaller firms can compete on the basis of cost leadership. Uh, they can position themselves in low cost areas and they can exploit their lower overhead costs, right? So if you're paying out more, right, you're making more. Family businesses can use family members as employees, or they can use a web presence uh, to market and sell their goods and services, right? We saw the thing where, you know, on one of those videos where the guy had the restaurant, right? And all the family members were coming in and they were all helping and assisting. Uh, you know, if, if we could get along, right, uh, we could do things, uh, things like that. Uh, but that, you know, that takes a little bit more than what's written in the textbook. Um, a small family-run uh, luncheonette uh, that purchases used equipment and offers a limited menu of standard breakfast and lunch items while not offering dinner also might be a good example of a small business that has opted for a cost leadership strategy. And, and that cost leadership strategy also has to do with the fact that they're not paying people for certain hours, right? Maybe you use utilizing that space for something different. Maybe it turns into a club. Um, you know, those are all interesting ways to look at things like, hey, I'm just dining. But after this certain time, I'm going to go over and have, here's this club, this lounge. Uh, you know, I've come been a, you know, a couple of like very nice restaurants and they've got a lounge like right across the way. And uh, and I think that's just a smart thing to do because you go, go have this expensive meal. Everybody's having fun. Everybody's, you know, possibly, you know, uh, you know, having some libations and whatnot. And and then what are they going to do after that? Well, if there's a lounge right there, they're just going to walk over to the lounge and they're going to continue their party from there. Uh, as opposed to going somewhere else. So uh, I think, you know, you have to be thinking in terms of, you know, what, what works, what works and what is going to be good for those people. Uh, differentiation, a differentiation strategy involves providing products or services that meet customer value in some unique way, right? So I'm going to meet your value, but I have to do it in a unique way. The uniqueness uh, may be derived in several, several ways. A uh, firm may try to build a particular brand image that differentiates itself from its competitors, right? Uh, you know, it's funny you say, pass me uh, a Kleenex, right? But it's a tissue, it's not a Kleenex. They've done such a good job, right? It's, give me a Coke. It's not a Coke, it's a soda, but they've done such a good job of you saying, okay, I, you know, pass me a Q-tip. I believe Q-tip's also a, a brand. It's not a, you know, whatever you call a Q-tip. I don't even know, I forget what it's even called <laughs> uh, because I always just call it a Q-tip. I believe Q-tip's a brand, not what it actually is, right? Uh, so, so interesting. Uh, go make a Xerox of that, right? That's a copy machine. Like some of you a little older know that, but, uh, you know, go make a Xerox of this because they did such a great job of saying, this is the only copywriter that we want coming out of your mouth. Um, Many clothing lines, such as Tommy Hilfiger, opt for this approach. Other firms will try to differentiate themselves on the basis of service that they provide. So, for example, Domino's began to distinguish itself uh, from other pizza firms by emphasizing the speed of delivery, right? Find your niche. Find, like, what makes you special and exploit it. And when I say exploit, I don't mean exploit it in a bad way. In a focus strategy, a firm concentrates uh, one or more uh, a set of one or more segments of the overall market. So focus can also be described as a niche strategy, right? Which I just referenced. Uh, focus strategy in, entails deciding to some extent that we do not want to have everyone as a customer. And I know that sounds crazy, but I, you know what? I don't need everyone as a customer because these people, this 25% of people are going to want refunds. So forget them. I don't want them. I don't want them. Don't bring them here. Uh, there are several ways that a firm can adopt a focus uh, perspective. Like just for example, if you're selling, you know, Mac computers, right? 
you're not going to expect people to come back and ask for a refund because they really want those computers, right? Uh, product line. So a firm limits its product line to specific items, uh, only one or more product types. So for example, California Cart Builder uh, produces only catering trucks and mobile kitchens, right? This is what we do best. This is what we're going to continue to do. This is where we're going to make our money. Let's stop making these things that we're not making money on. Uh, so for a customer, a firm concentrates on uh, serving the needs of a particular type of customer. Uh, weight Watchers concentrates on people who wish to control their weight or lose weight, right? Hey, you skinny people, hey, we, we don't need you as a customer. That's fine. We need people who want to do certain things, who want to watch their weight, and, and that's okay, right? It's not Everything is not for everybody. If it was for everybody, then, you know, you wouldn't have the same type of competition. So, for example, uh, Planet Fitness. Are you big, strong? I'm putting chalk on my hands. I'm deadlifting. I'm grunting. I'm, I'm lifting huge weights and yelling and screaming. Hey, Planet Fitness is not for you. That's not the place. That's the place for everybody else, right? You go to these other gyms where you can get your, you know, big lifts on, but Planet Fitness is not for you, right? So you see how some companies are going to differentiate and they don't need everybody as a customer. And that's okay. They say, hey, all you big dudes, you know, lifting all this weight, we don't need you as a customer. Um, you, you're not paying your gym dues anyway, right? So you go over where you go. We're going to get the people who just want to come in, get a little cardio. They're worried about their health. And they want to get some good work in. Uh, without the yelling and screaming and the chalk flying everywhere. Uh, in a geographic area, uh, many small firms out of necessity will limit themselves to a particular geographic region. Uh, microbrewers um, generally serve a limited geographic region, and that's because like you, you can't pack it up and ship it somewhere. It's not going to be the same. If you know anything about like microbrew, um, you know, so it's, it's like, hey, we got to be within this, this small area, which is, which is fine and, and you know, smart and profitable, and they got those people that will continue to come back. A particular distribution channel, uh, firms may wish to limit themselves with respect to the, uh, by the means in which they sell their products. Amazon began and remains a firm that sells only through the internet. We don't want to open up an Amazon store where, and I know that they purchase Whole Foods and you know, the Fresh Kitchen and stuff like that, but we're just talking the basis of their business. Um, we don't want to open up a brick and mortar store. Everything's done through the internet. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest, like I said, if I can pick up my phone and purchase something from Amazon. I'm probably going to do it as opposed to going into the store just because I don't know at my age. I just do not want to go to the mall. I don't want to go to the store anymore. I don't know, you know what happened to me, but I just, I just don't. I'd rather just pick the phone up and then order it from there. Um, so here's some key takeaways uh, from that section before we get into the other learning objectives uh, for the rest of this chapter. And like I said, I'll still try and keep the lecture under 30 minutes. Uh, any firm, regardless of size, uh, needs to know how it will compete, right? Uh, this is a firm strategy. Strategy identifies how a firm will provide value to its customers within its operational constraints. Uh, strategy can be reduced to four major approaches, uh, like I said, cost leadership, differentiation, cost focus, and differentiation focus. And once a given strategy is selected, all of a firm's operations uh, should be geared to implementing that strategy, right? Uh, you know, everybody needs to be rowing the boat the same direction. Uh, no strategy will be successful forever and therefore uh, needs to be constantly evaluated. And you always go back to Blockbuster. I mean, I remember even myself going in there trying to find a Blockbuster card, going to get me a, a what was I getting? Um, Butterfinger ice cream. Give me a Butterfinger ice cream, maybe two or three, and get me a movie. And I was ready to go, right? And I remember first it was VHS, and then, then it became, oh, we oh, got these DVDs, right? So a DVD player, I couldn't find a, a VCR right now to save my life, right? Uh, you know, so then it was DVDs. And now I do not think that I have any DVD players in the house, and I don't have a computer that takes a CD. And you see how we've progressed, and things have changed, and now we're just, you know, so far away from the way things used to be. Uh, business plan. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, now you guys, uh, if you go to score like capital S C O R E, right. They have a great business plan, great template, great format. Um, of course you can, you know, razzle dazzle and do great one better than that, but it's a great template for anybody to make sure that it works. Or if you want to look at that and see, okay, let me make my own, but use that as some type of framework. Uh, so you want to understand these are some learning objectives. You want to understand uh, that the probability of running a successful business is significantly increased uh, with a formal business plan, right? You can't just wing it. Uh, you know, you want to put, you know, a uh, pen to paper and create that or finger to, to keyboard because who writes anymore um, and create that business plan. 
Uh, understand that although small businesses, uh, business owners uh, express reasons for not planning, they do themselves a great disservice by not having a formal plan. It's not, not a good idea. Uh, understand that businesses uh, that seek to secure external funding must produce a formal plan, right? You can't, I'm not going to give you any money if you don't have a business plan. It's like, hey, Demetrius, you know, let me get $10,000 for my business, right? Why? Right? Well, do, am I ever going to see this $10,000 again? Probably not, right? If you don't have a business plan, um, you know, always a good rule of thumb in life, you know, because I'm sure, you know, people ask for personal loans and things of that nature. Don't give it away if you're, if you're expecting for it to come back. Because it's highly likely that it's never coming back. I'm sure everybody's, not everybody, but some people have been in that situation. Maybe you're the one on the other side of the coin. But that money is never coming back, right? When they borrow it, it's never coming back. Uh, so intelligent plan is a first step to success. The man who plans knows where he's going, knows what uh, progress he is making, and uh, it has a pretty good idea of when he will arrive. Uh, planning is the open road to your destination. If you don't know where you're going, how can you expect to get there, right? You wouldn't try and say, I want to get to, to the moon. Well, how do you get there, right? I want to get to, you know, South Bay Galleria. Well, how, how do you get there? You're not just going to walk outside and, you know, go like that and look around, right? You have to have some type of plan. You have to know where your steps are going, where they're being uh, directed. So that's a, a quote from Basil Walsh. Uh, basically, there are two main reasons for developing a comprehensive business plan. Uh, so number one, a plan will be extraordinarily useful in ensuring the successful operation of your business. And two, if one is seeking to secure external funds, which most are from banks, venture capitalists, or other investors, it's essential uh, that you be able to demonstrate to them uh, that they will be recovering their money and making a profit, right? So it's not just that they want to recover the funds that they put in, they want to get some money from it as well, right? They're letting you hold their money. They want some money in return. So um, here are some uh, things and some key questions that you definitely have to consider. Is the business uh, a strategy feasible, right? Is that meaning is that something that you can actually do? Uh, what are the chances it will make money, right? You have to make money, you wanna be profitable. Do I have the operational requirements for starting and running a successful business, right? Most times people don't and they have to go back to the drawing board. Uh, not, not most times people, but a lot of times people that don't will have to go back to, to the drawing board. Uh, have I considered a well thought out marketing plan that clearly identifies who my customers will be? So if I know who those customers are going to be, it's easy for me to market to them. Uh, do I clearly understand what value I will provide to these customers? Uh, what will be the means of distribution to provide the product or the service uh, to my customers, right? Uh, is it, hey, you know, most things are sent by UPS, FedEx, or Amazon, right? Uh, have I clarified to myself the financial issues associated with starting and operating the business, right? Uh, am, I, am I clear about that, right? A lot of times people, people are not. And do I have to re-examine uh, these notions to ensure success, right? You know, do you have to go back to the drawing board? Uh, unfortunately, it appears that many small businesses do not take any effort to build even an initial business plan, let alone maintain the planning process as an ongoing operation, right? So you, even though you put it out there in the beginning, you still got to, you know, keep it going. Uh, even though there's clear evidence that there is failure that the failure to plan may have serious consequences uh, for uh, future success of such firms. Uh, unwillingness to plan uh, may be understandable in non-employed businesses where it's just like one person, but it is inexcusable as a business uh, grows in size, right? I know everything times of the essence, same thing with me, but you gotta do it. Uh, why, uh, therefore, do businesses fail uh, when, you know, to begin the, the actual planning process? Uh, you know, I'm just going to I'm not going to, you know, get all the way into it, you know, for the sake of time. But some of them think that one, that they don't need to plan. Uh, others think that they're too busy to plan. Other uh, say like plans don't produce results. I got to sell, 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 sell. Right. And uh, we are not familiar with the process of formal planning. Well, you know, most people aren't because they haven't gone through that process until they actually do. Um, you know, in your textbook, I want you to, you know, make sure that you pay close attention to different ways of getting funding, like venture capitalists, uh, you know, but, you know, you have to be careful and, and look and listen to what the text says about what they want in return, right? Do I want this, you know, if you watch like Shark Tank or something like that, I want this percentage of your business, I want this in this amount of time, 
uh, you know, I'm going to give you 15 million, but in 25 years, I want 20 million back, right? Uh, you know, are you able to, to do so? Uh, angel investors uh, that originally came from those individuals who invested in Broadway shows and films, but angel investors are themselves successful entrepreneurs, right? As with venture capitalists, they are looking for returns uh, higher than they can normally find in the market. However, they offer expert returns uh, they often expect returns lower than those anticipated by venture capitalists. Venture capitalists, has, they're going to give you that perspective with those numbers and say, this is what you need to get back to me. Uh, and if you can't, then this is uh, definitely not going to work. All right, so that's it for uh, chapter five. Make sure that you watch the lecture. So if you got to this point, you did watch the lecture. Make sure you watch the supplemental videos, uh, complete the discussion, and complete your chapter five quiz and you'll be all good to go. It's always, you know, kind of same bad time, same bad channel uh, with this course. Uh, make sure that you're, you know, reading the material, uh, you know, make sure that you're listening to the lecture and the videos because, you know, it's not going to be a video that's posted unless it has something applicable uh, to do with, uh, you know, this class and what you've been doing. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, always available uh, via email and I'll be glad to assist. Uh, otherwise, thanks a lot and hopefully you have a great day.